Hello. Hi. It won't give me my lower third. Um, there you go. Yeah, but it won't yeah. give me my custom one. It has my name and stuff. It has your name. Oh, well. No, no, my universe today and has my little picture. Oh, and yeah, right, I'm not sure right, what right. Yeah, my... we're, we're seeing your winter jacket right now. Yeah, I know. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, hey. Hi. How's it going? It's a Monday. Yeah, but but it's apparently the Monday of all Mondays. A Monday that was fed to another Monday for that twice Monday goodness, right? Yeah, yeah, that 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 pretty much describes it very accurately. Now I bet people are gonna say that I have my wrong microphone. Yeah, it does sound wrong. But yeah. I'm also in Bluetooth headphones, so weird. It's not seeing my I apologize. Mm -hmm. There we go. How about now? Yay, you sound Yay. Beautiful. I would have, should have noticed that. I have to turn that off. Man, I apologize. Uh, okay. <laughs> These things happen. It's okay. Not, not to me. Not on my watch. <clears throat> there it is. And that's, uh, man, that that was close. But actually, when I forget to switch microphones, like I've been traveling and so I had to carry my my blue snowball, and as soon as I detach yeah. things, then the whole computer <laughs> forgets which device is connected and so on and so forth. Um, all right. Okay, cool. <clears throat> now I'm ready to uh, to record. Everything's going to be good. People can hear me okay. So, hey, if you have wondering what on earth you've stumbled into, this is a live episode of us recording Astronomy Cast. I'm Fraser Kane. That's Dr. Pamela Gay over there somewhere. Um, Hi. <clears throat> And uh, together we are Astronomy Cast. Us. We are. And this is going to be episode 339, where we talk about space conspiracy theories. So if you're new, that means that we, because we have some unnumbered un special episodes in there, we have like, uh, well, they're half an hour episodes, so we have like about 200 hours of audio that you can go through. <laughs> <laughs> Should you... And I always laugh about it. When we first started doing the show, people would show up and they're like, I caught up because, you know, in the 10 episodes or whatever, it took to catch up to where we were. And uh, and then they say, please record more episodes. They don't say that anymore. They, But some people do bravely go through four or five episodes in a day and they catch up. So <clears throat> I don't know what's, what's with those people. What, what, what I love is we seem to have two justifications. We are people's exercise partners and methods of going to sleep. Yeah. One of those is more comforting than the uh, other. I know, I know. We help, and we, we keep them company during long drives. We help them exercise, and we put them to sleep. But I, I will, you know what, I will admit, good for something. I will admit to using podcasts to go to sleep sometimes. It's actually very effective. Uh, but I'm not going to tell the poor podcasters who, uh, who I actually use to put myself to sleep. Just, uh, that's just cruel. Um... Okay, so uh, we're going to take about half an hour to record today's episode, and then we will stick around for a few minutes and answer people's questions about space and astronomy. And I'm certain that people are going to want to ask questions about the topic that we've chosen for today. So if you want to participate, um, <laughs> Rich Hayward is calling this a microphone conspiracy. Um, yeah, so if you want to participate, what you do is go to uh, the Q&A app. So wherever you're watching this, there should be like a little thing that says that we're answering questions on air or something like that. Uh, let me just give you the exact terminology. It says, be part of the conversation. Click to join live Q&A on Google Plus Hangouts. So that, you all right? You all right there? Um, uh, yeah, so you can join us uh, and ask any questions that you might want, and we will uh, either, either if it's during the show and there's some conspiracy that we've forgotten, just trigger the idea, and then we'll try and incorporate into the show and, and take responsibility for it, um, take all the credit. But otherwise, uh, wait till the end, and then you know if you have some questions, and we'll talk about it further, and I know people are going to have a lot of questions, so... Uh, oh, and I want to just sort of give a big shout out to my new favorite game, which is called Space Team. Have you played this yet, Pamela? No, best game ever. It's a it's a like a multiplayer game, so you have to play better than two. Kerbal. Uh, no, no, just it's just my you know you know me. I'm I have the attention span of a 
you know, gnat. Um, squirrel. Uh, so it's like two people, two to four people, and it's played on Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So you have to be standing around each other. And what it is is essentially you have to act as a space team. And you and the other person have to issue commands to each other to make it through these, these zones. So you might, you know, you've got a set of controls, I've got a set of controls on my phone, and then I'd be saying things like, engage the hyper, hyper warp, and you'll be telling me to do things like, you know, uh, release the prisoners, and I'll be like, uh, you know, turn on the the mu proton array, and you'll be like having to switch these controls. And there's asteroids. Every time there's an asteroid, we both have to shake our phones, and every time there's a there's a wormhole, we have to turn our phones upside down. It is hilarious. And if you're looking for like a team building exercise for um, for people, it's so much fun. So it's called Space Team, and uh, yes, Neil, it is better than 2048, way better. I mean, yeah, see, I, I have this problem known as, like, I, I lost three months of my life to mudding in college. No, and, this, this and, game won't keep you amused longer than half an hour, right? Okay. And, then it's, and then there's nothing else. So, uh, yeah, yeah, give it, give it a try. But it, just, you know, install it and then just play it with friends, and it's just super fun. It's like, it feels like when you're first playing um, uh, cards, with, uh, cards Against Humanity. Like, you just have this feeling. You're like, you have unlocked some secret hilarity that you just didn't realize was there. And but, but unlike Cards Against Humanity, I probably won't fear that I'm about to transgress some no. harassment policy no. by playing the winning cards. No, all you, all you will do is giggle as you attempt to uh, navigate these, uh, the terrors of space. So that, try to space team. Awesome. Uh, okay, well, let's get ready to record. <laughs> oh. Okay. I'm I'm ready to like press record and all that. I am also ready and have done I, so. I pressed it. It's recording. It's using the correct microphone and it's in mono. Hello, Preston. <laughs> Hi, Preston. Uh, hey, Preston, you should play Space Team. It's awesome. Okay, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 339, Space Conspiracy Theories. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Great. Now, first, I need to wish happy birthday to me, and not me specifically, but to Universe Today, which as of March 23rd, 2014 is 15 years old. Dang. I know, right? 15 years I've been running a uh, universe today. So for the last, what, seven, almost eight, we've been doing Astronomy Cast. So how cool is that? That it, It's really, we're the old people of the internet. <laughs> I know, we are. It's terrifying to think about. Uh, people keep claiming that internet thing, that's for the youth. It's like, no. <laughs> Um, so, and then one other thing is to, uh, let's give a one, another shout-out, we're probably doing this every week, for yeah. the hangout thon that's coming up in, in yes. like a month. So, April uh, 26th, 27th, we are going to produce 36 straight hours of content, uh, everything from uh, discussing space and politics to uh, education to live episode of Astronomy Cast, live episode of the Virtual uh, Star Party, not that those aren't live generally, but special episodes during the hangout a -thon. And uh, the goal is to raise money to keep all of our humans employed um, because eating is good and doing science is good and the federal government, uh, well, doesn't fund things that are good necessarily. Okay, one last time. What's the date? It's April 26th, 27th. Perfect. All right, let's get on with today's episode. Yes, we actually landed on the moon. No, aliens didn't crash at Roswell. What is it about space exploration that leads to so many conspiracy theories? We'll try to get to the bottom of these conspiracy theories, poke holes in their ridiculous ideas, and help you build your baloney detection kit. Oh, where to start, where to start. So uh, so what do you... Do you want to start with older ones, newer ones, most ridiculous ones? Uh, and then we'll start trying to undercover the, the philosophy. Pick one at random. Give me a, a space conspiracy theory that, that uh, you think is hilarious. Uh, crop circles. 
Whoa, good one. Okay, yeah. So, so what are what are crop circles? Uh, so, so basically, there's all these images generally taken either from up on a hill uh, or uh, taken from an aircraft or something else, and they show these often amazing geographic. Um, this, that, and the other thing, uh, circles, uh, circles and triangles and squares, uh, fractal patterns, and the claim is that it is not possible for humans to create such patterns overnight, and, and the reality is, yeah, it is. It just requires rope and wood, and really, it's not that hard. Get over yourselves. Well, and I think the most hilarious part about this is that the person who, the team of people who actually created these crop circles and kind of invented it in the first place just couldn't take the rampant conspiracy theories anymore and demonstrated how they did it. They took full responsibility. They showed all of their tools. They made crop circles for people, and... People still, people still don't believe them. It, it's really kind of amazing. And what, what I love is, is like if you go to, to Avesbury, the standing stones that aren't Stonehenge in England, um, the, the gift shop that, that's at the part of Avesbury where the park is and where the pub is um, has this entire wall of pictures of crop circles that were taken all throughout the United Kingdom. And... Last time I was there, they had this little handwritten sign saying uh, something along the lines of, we are not condoning that this was done by aliens. But the fact that they, they're there causes people to think, oh, it's aliens, because Avesbury standing circles, fairy magic, all of this somehow gets tangled together. Um, yeah, it's kind of confusing. So I think I want to put one little nugget of that into the into the psychology conversation that we're going to have a little bit later, which is that even though it's been completely and totally debunked by the people who started the scam, it doesn't it hasn't slow down it, crazy. It doesn't slow down. If anything, it's it's been increasing. Okay, so crop circles is is a great and man that is that is just like boiled down to its perfect essence. It's simple, easy to explain. That's a space conspiracy theory. Um, so let's keep going. Um, well, along the same lines, and, and this wasn't on the list I remember to send you ahead of time, but it, we just made me think of it, is the whole the pyramids, the, the Stargate theory, that the pyramids all around the world, pick a culture that built a pyramid, they had the help of aliens. And no. <laughs> and no, they did not. We're, but, we're still not entirely sure how the pyramids were built, but that's mostly a problem of uh, we prefer not to think that that many slaves got killed, but that's a personal problem. Uh, well, I mean, I know that the pyramids are in some way, I mean, they're very carefully aligned, what, north-south? So the way they've been, the way they've been structured, the way they've been placed, you know, there's clearly some thought about geography, and there's you know some theories that they match what the uh, a the belt, belt of Orion, and Orion. and I'm actually good with that being true because the the Egyptians were master geometrists, and the idea that they would align them perfectly north south so they could get all of the pyramids completely symmetric, I don't know about you, but I'm the everything must align person when it comes to doing things in like Illustrator or some place that allows me vector art. Well, it, this is like the masonry version of vector art. They just made sure everything aligned with what they had to align it to, which was the North Pole. Uh, so no big deal on that. Why not make them look like the Belt of Orion if, if you believe that there's uh, deities in the heavens? Um, I'm good with that part. I'm just not good with the whole notion of it required an alien spaceship to come down and say, thou shalt and provide the technology. No, that didn't happen. And it's funny because you get this situation, and again, this is another part of the conversation for the psychology discussion, which is that you can have a situation that you're not certain how they did a thing. It is unknown. How exactly did the Egyptians move those stones from you know, dozens of kilometers away, the rock from the quarry, to get it across the desert, to get into position, to get it up the hill, to get it in place. Was it a great big earthen ramp? Was it some kind of scaffolding system? Was it cranes? Whatever. 
Yeah. We don't know exactly how they did it, and they didn't provide good explanation. But just because you don't know how something was done, then doesn't require the leap to aliens did it. And and people do stupid things that you wouldn't naturally figure out how they did it. So so for instance, on on Fail Blog yesterday, I saw a photo of a big forklift holding a smaller forklift holding a smaller forklift, and this stack of of forklifts lifting forklifts, the smallest of the forklifts, was carrying up the stuff they needed to get to the second story. I personally, if I knew what set of forklifts they had available, would never have considered stacking for forklifts because that falls into the not exactly safe category of things to do. But a forklift so, is just a weight, right? And so, you know, a forklift can yeah, carry a weight. They, they can carry a weight, but that whole calculating center of mass thing I know didn't occur. So... Mm. It just seems rather unsafe. And and so I'm sure there's ideas that, that they came up with, given the tools they had on hand, that we simply haven't come up with. And that's cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. So that's good. I, uh, this is great. I, I, I would love to unpack your rationale and the direction of the ones you're picking. But, uh, but please continue. What else uh, is a space conspiracy theory? I, well, the, the rationale simply went from... Uh, uh, stone circles to pyramids seem to be related in my head. Why not? Um, so is it? Are you sure that it's not the uh, you know the secret NASA money, the the uh, the government uh, cover up that's making sure that you don't speak about the uh, the alien cover up? Hmm? Well, well, you you mentioned initially oldest to newest, All right. so I wasn't too worried about that. If you want a NASA conspiracy, the I think most tragic NASA conspiracy is actually involving Apollo One, where Scott Grissom, Gus Grissom's son, and one of the engineers involved with the mission um, have made sad, tragic claims that the fire on Apollo 1 was actually purposefully caused because they didn't want Gus Grissom to be the first person to the moon. And that, the idea that his son would be part of that, it, it's just heartbreaking. And the idea behind that conspiracy theory is the short that caused the fire on Apollo 1. It was an oxygen-rich environment combusted, everyone inside died, they didn't have a method to really get the door open, it was just horrifying, death by fire, I think has got to be the most horrendous way to die. Um, and the claim is that the, the switch that was switched that caused the short, the short was something that purposefully occurred, um, because things just weren't constructed correctly. Um, I mean, it was a bunch of things, right? There was, there was high pressure of oxygen in the, in the capsule, the door was difficult to release, that they had flammable material in it, they weren't kind of trained for fire in the situation, it was difficult for them to get out of their harnesses. I mean, they went, after the fire, they went back and completely redesigned everything they did inside the capsule with this risk in mind because you can just imagine how terrifying and awful it would be if they were actually in space when you know when when that happened you would get a repeat of this disaster and so but 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 the and, and I'll, I'll be honest this conspiracy theory is completely new to me so so there is the theory that that it was that, that the NASA... fire was started intentionally that NASA was so insert expletive that um, the the Mercury capsule Gus Grissom had gone up in had been lost at sea because he opened the door wrong and there was panic involved. Um, that they didn't want him to be the first person on the moon. And um, because they were pissed off, Okay, there I went and used the expletive. You can beep that, Preston. Um, <laughs> we have a phone. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Tiny intern, our happy little tiny intern, is is perched in the chair behind me working, and, and her, her computer was very happy to be alive. Um, 
<laughs> okay, sorry, Preston. sorry, Preston. I'm telling you to edit things, and that was perfectly timed for a mistake. Okay, um, all the things to chop out, Preston. You know what? While we're doing that, I'm going to go remind children to be quiet. Give me one second. Okay, it's that time of day. We yeah, are telling everything to be quiet. Um, Lindsay, you want to pop up and say hi while Preston tells his kids to be quiet? You mean now that I've ruined everything? Yes. You didn't ruin anything. <laughs> I had just ruined things by, by swearing online. Hello. So so this is uh, Lindsay Odman, tiny intern. She's the, the one who writes our press releases, keeps me sane. Um, she's basically our public information officer, and um, we are happy to have her on, and she works on graphics and all the things. So when you see us refer to tiny intern... Hi, it's me. <laughs> okay, and now we're okay. back. Hardwood floor right above my, my recording area. Not good during lunchtime. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we only have hardwood floors, so <laughs> that keeps it interesting. And I just realized that I'm, like, cutting off the corner of my frame. Okay, there we go. I'm sure people really enjoy this. Uh, okay, so when last we saw our <laughs> heroes, um, we were talking about the fire. We were talking about that it was intentional. Right. So, so the the conspiracy theory is that NASA was so determined because they were upset that they'd lost one of the mercury capsules that they essentially killed off Gus Grissom rather than let him get the attention for going to the moon. Yeah, isn't that the most tragic? And it's yeah. it, the the conspiracy theory is coming from his son, and yeah. it, it breaks my heart. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's move on. Uh, that's just awful and wrong. And you wanted a NASA conspiracy theory. Yeah, I didn't want one that was so. No, I I, I wanted them all. I want all of the conspiracy theories. I. I mean, I don't even know what to say, so let's just move on. Uh, so let's talk about, while we're talking about Apollo projects, let's just talk about the, the, the moon landings. So, so my favorite, and this isn't one of the standard debunked, um, but it's nonetheless my favorite moon hoax, um, or moon conspiracy theory, it's not a hoax, a moon conspiracy theory, is that the Soviets, back in the days when it was the Soviet Union, um, had launched an astronaut to the moon, um, with one of their um, standard missions, and it it wasn't an unmanned spacecraft, but rather one that had a cosmonaut on it that they had absolutely no way of getting home. And there was a mission launched right before the first Apollo mission. Um, and the idea is that you have Buzz Aldrin standing there, digging up rocks, doing his rock collecting thing, and up over the horizon comes a dehydrated, half-starved cosmonaut going, hey, guys, can I have a ride home, please? Um, that and one they left him no there? I don't know how the rest of that story plays out other than there's absolutely no evidence for conspiracy theory of, of cosmonaut on the moon. And this one goes into the whole, the Nazis had a lunar base on the far side of the moon, and um, there's also the theory that there were, depending on which set of conspiracies you read, anywhere from one to three cosmonauts that died on takeoff prior to Yuri Gagarin um, successfully making it into space. Um, and, and the thing with that one is, prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, I, I think all of us were willing to say, yeah, that, that sounds like it could be true. We're good with that one. Um, can't go either way. But James Oberg, uh, who's a really great space researcher, he does investigative reporting. He's actually pretty good with Russian. Uh, he went over and did a great deal of research after the collapse of the Soviet Union, digging into the now open archives, and found um, evidence of at least one cosmonaut dying during training, but none dying during takeoff uh, that we didn't already know about. But the fact that it's now been Russia for so long, so many things have been released, so many cosmonauts have go ahead, gone ahead and written histories, written their versions of the right stuff, 
And we haven't seen any of them, um, and we haven't seen any now-released records indicating to there being corpses of cosmonauts orbiting the planet or anything like that. Um, so I, I think that one we can sort of say uh, propaganda from the Cold War that we can now say, no, actually they didn't kill anyone off. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, that... I mean, I wouldn't say it necessarily sounds believable, but, I mean, the fact that that, that Oberg went and mm -hmm. dug into this, you know, that, yeah. that if anyone could hide such a thing, you could imagine a very secretive totalitarian government might try and take a shot at that. Uh, yeah, totally agree. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm pretty sure we can write that one as, nope. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the moon landings because I think this is where a lot of this is leading. So the theory goes that the theory goes the theory goes that we didn't actually land on the moon. That the entire moon landings were done as a you know on a set somewhere and by Stanley Kubrick by Stanley Kubrick and uh, and then nobody actually went to the moon. Now now there is a classic Mitchell and Webb look. Uh, uh, skit, comedy skit, and you can look it up on YouTube. Just look, look for Mitchell and Webb uh, moon landing. And the gist of the skit is that they're planning the conspiracy and they're saying, well, you know, we're going to save all this money because we won't need a massive moon rocket. And the and the one of the researchers says, no, no, we're going to need a massive moon rocket because people are going to wonder how did they get to the moon and they're like, they went in that massive rocket. Okay, fine. And so you know, so they're capable of going to the moon. So the the conspiracy is hilarious because all of the pieces were in place to literally get, you know, they had to launch a rocket capable of the moon. The astronauts had to return in a capsule. They brought moon rocks back. So, you know. There had to be something that the amateur astronomers could watch flying toward the moon and track on its way back. And now um, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is taking pictures in high resolution of the surface of the moon, including all of the lunar landing sites. No Nazi secret base, no uh, dead Russian cosmonaut, only the the landing sites as we are aware of them. And so it, I, go ahead. I, I have heard a really interesting twist on this theory, and I, I've asked to be shown more information on it. Um, Chris Judd, who Judge rather, uh, who was on Stargate, um, one interesting argument he put forward was Stanley Kubrick did film because he had a camera that matched one of the the NASA cameras, did film the entire landing segment that was shown on television, but the actual landing occurred, and the real issue was we didn't yet have trustable technology to do live television and the argument that one of the arguments that he used um, was the I think it was the Super Bowl that year had failure in its live broadcast so the concern was here is the biggest moment in history and this is a global history everyone around the globe embraces the moment that humans first landed on the moon and this moment couldn't be trusted to the technology of the time. So yes, there were astronauts. Yes, everything that, that theoretically happened actually did happen. Um, but the broadcast that was shown on television was actually pre-recorded by Kubrick. Um, that one intrigues me. I'm not saying it's real. I'm saying it intrigues me. Please tell me more. I'm calling um, nonsense. Because there was gigantic dishes set up. There's a whole yeah, movie no, called no, The I, Dish in Australia right. that that was receiving the signal and the hijinks that happened for them to be able to receive the signal from the landing. That, you know, that's where the broadcast came from was the general direction of, I don't know, the moon. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely not. I'm calling total nonsense. I, 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 and, and, and All I'm, the nonsense. No. Please. And what I'm saying is... Um, part of me, the part that all of us have that wants to believe in random, insert noun, um, there's, there's this, I wonder if they actually filmed a backup just in case, well, things failed down in Australia. Um, that would amuse me to no end. I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying 
it intrigues me. Tell me more. I'm going to add that to my psychology uh, collection here. <laughs> uh, let's keep going. So let's talk about aliens. Let's talk about the fact that there are aliens all among us. Aliens in, in, in the yeah. skies, and they are visiting us on a regular basis. So, so I think my favorite Aliens Visiting Earth book of, of all books that I've read is John Scalzi's Agents to the Stars. And the, the uh, not giving away the punchline uh, adapted from the publisher's summary version of this book is stinky, smelly, uh, not particularly cute aliens come recognize that they can't really befriend the humans without terrifying them or at least deeply offending them with their body odor. And, and so they find a Hollywood agent to uh, help them come up with a plan for introducing themselves to the human race. And um, the thing that gets pointed out in, in this particular book is there's pretty much no way to enter the atmosphere without getting noticed. And, and the problem is uh, NORAD. Um, all the countries with military radar. Now, if you come in over the ocean, who are you going to abduct? You may not get noticed, as we've recently learned with the tragedy of flight MH370. But when it comes to entering populated zones, populated zones are covered with radar, and they're also covered with people with dashboard cams and phones. And, and as has recently been uh, pointed out over and over and over by the meteorite men, um, when rocks come down, which they do on a regular basis, and rocks are way smaller than spacecraft, they're easy to spot. Everyone takes video of them, and we can go figure out where they landed and look for the fragments. When the space shuttle came in for a landing at night, it was the most amazing thing because you could see the ionization of the gas in the atmosphere. You could hear the sonic boom caused by the deceleration. Um, it was just fabulous. There's no other way to put it. Uh, you can sort of imagine an alien race coming up with a form of powered landing that would prevent the sonic boom, but you can't, at least I can't, come up with a way to do this uh, that isn't very bright. Um, so, so how are they getting here that not one Russian dashboard can has yeah. caught it? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> for me, I think it's more of a logical conversation like like I think about the the Fermi paradox and you know we've talked about this quite a bit in the past this idea that that you know that there must be some explanation for why we're not visited by aliens because if you end up with aliens at any one part of the of the entire Milky Way within about a million years like mold on a sandwich you end up with aliens everywhere and so if you've got all these little places all the way through the Milky Way on the 400 billion stars, you know, you might get the alien that shows up with their super advanced space drive and they quietly come in and they look just like us and they, they blend with humanity and they talk to the government and they join, you know, forces to oppress humanity. But for every one of those, you're going to have a thousand that come in with their great big Independence Day spacecraft, hover over cities and bully us. And so, you know, you're just going to end up with hundreds, thousands of these aliens showing up in all manner of spacecraft and and so, so, so you can't you have guarantee preconditioned notions in this. So so a very interesting I one so of the they're things monolith that and their pyramids <laughs> and their Shush <laughs> Wait. You know, only only Neil deGrasse Tyson has been shushed. And Lawrence Krauss has been given that shush, the shush heard around the world. I, I feel like I'm part of an esteemed collection. Please continue. Okay, so so I, I've been on a science fiction reading binge, but trying to find science fiction that, is necess it, that isn't necessarily astronomy. I'm looking for the other sciences. And uh, one of the, the books that, that I stumbled upon, upon was the cruise you and I were on a couple of years ago. There was author Robert Sawyer on it. And I have to admit, and I hate to admit, I hadn't read any of his books prior to the cruise. And so I've been working to fix that because he was such a nice guy. It's like, okay, going to read all of the books of the nice guy. And one of his books is called Calculating God. And the idea behind it is 
um, a pair of alien races come to Earth on the same spacecraft, and they're not here to talk to our politicians. They're, they kind of refuse to talk to our politicians. They're here to talk to different segments of society, um, including a paleontologist at, um, I believe it's one of the Toronto museums. He's a Canadian writer. Um, and all of the aliens believe in God, which is where the name comes from, and of course the Ameri the, the Canadian scientist doesn't. But, but one of the things that comes up as a theme in this book is the reason that this, the universe isn't swarming with space-faring races is as soon as they can, societies reach the point technologically of transferring their intelligence from the, the body which has a finite life to the digital realm where souls, psyches, whatever word you want to have, personalities, um, pick a noun. Um, that essence of who we are can be digitally transferred into a virtual world where these, these non-biological people um, can live forever. And once they've transferred themselves into this digital reality, they go to all sorts of extremes from locking up the tectonics of their planet to whatever to protect these, these computers, but they're no longer spacefaring because they're now memory-based life forms instead of physically-based life forms. So, so if imagine that the part of the Drake equation that says the number of intelligent uh, species out there that we can detect um, is bound by how long the spacefaring race is out there isn't only capped by how long until they're destroyed by disease, war, whatever, but also by how long before they digitize themselves. It was just an interesting premise I'd never thought of before. And for every mold that digitizes himself, and there will be 5,000 molds that end up colonizing the entire sandwich. That's all I'm saying. So <laughs> let's please continue, because uh, we're running out of time. Um, uh, so one, some, one of our viewers actually just suggested a good one, which was the, uh, the face on Mars. Oh, jeez. Oh, right? So, that one's been totally debunked. Totally debunked, Thank right? you, Mars High Rise. Yes. Uh, the short version is that the original image is from the... Was it the Mars, the Viking program? Mariner? Mariner, yeah. Released an image of a mesa on Mars that looked like a face, like a due kind of a lighting face. Yeah, it was due to lighting. And then when until so people thought that was evidence that there was aliens on Mars, big cover-up, uh, that there was Martians on Mars... Um, and the big cover up, and then the uh, later on high resolution images showed it was just a hill. What a big surprise! Yeah, hills happen. Uh, hills happen, yeah. And that it wasn't this ancient region on Mars with a Martian civilization. Okay, so we've got a few more minutes left. Um, I just want to talk about the, the psychology. So, why space? Why well, it, space is as, as as such a fertile conspiracy theory place? I, I think it's because society's um, decision on where magic comes from has migrated, and by magic, I mean any thing sufficiently advanced that we can't explain it with modern science can be conceived of as something reverent. Um, so it used to be in Chinese lore, you had the... Um, spirit that would come sit on your chest, um, and and this was something to be feared. Um, and now the same, and and I think you've mentioned you suffer from this. The same physical issue that causes you to wake up with your body still paralyzed when you go to sleep. Your your body releases a yeah, chemical that essentially paralyzes. Yeah. yeah, and and this way you don't generally beat up whoever you're sharing the bed with when you have a bad dream. Uh, you can wake up while still in that sleep paralysis and it used to be, and Amy Tan has this in some of her books, wrapped in quite nicely as a plot element, um, people would wake up and there there was this, this ghost sitting on their chest or witch sitting on their chest if it was European lore and now it's the aliens have per paralyzed you. Um, 
so it's it's your body grasping at straws and trying to find a supernatural way and I'm classing aliens in with supernatural here to explain something that otherwise can't be explained because people don't know psychology and I mean we have literally you know there is so many more there is the the reptilian aliens there's planet X there you know Nibiru little gray men little gray men um, the early the ancient astronauts with the Aztecs and the Mayans like it just goes on and on and on with these with these conspiracy theories and it generally boils down to people trying to explain something that they don't have the intellectual tools to explain using science. They either lack enough facts or lack enough understanding of science. And, and there's very little that we haven't figured out how to explain by having an, enough people dedicated to pulling on ropes and using something as wheels, pulleys etc. Um, everything from the standing stones on Easter Island that people have blamed on aliens to the, the Mayan uh, gods where um, they, they say there was the white man who came, like literally a man who was white, not white man like Caucasian. Um, all of these things get blamed on aliens, um, but then when you look at, okay, what technology did they have, and you get enough of your buddies and your undergrads and your, your colleagues to pull on ropes, you, you can recreate how they move these things. Standing stones at Stonehenge, all of these things. Yeah. All right. Well, this was fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. And we stop the recording. And save the recording. Do you think that uh, Lindsay knows we can see her? Yes. She's aware. she's aware that she's in frame? Yeah. Right. Um, better not ruin this. What are you looking to ruin? Yeah. Right. I'm overwriting I have another file, and I don't want to... So I'm going to save this as something different. Thank you. Did you misname something at some point? No, I had to restart because I had the wrong. Oh, right, right, yeah, right. I had the wrong recording, the wrong devices, and it wasn't just yeah. accepting it. So, um, okay, cool. Uh, well, Lindsay, let Lindsay know that she got all kinds of hellos. I will. <laughs> Lindsay, hi, tiny intern. You got many hi, tiny interns from our audience. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Did the mic pick that up? Yes. That was awesome. I'll remove those. <laughs> Hello, I Lindsay like Tiny. To explode again because I have my phone turned off now, so that it doesn't start <laughs> screaming at you too. So, so periodically when we mention her name, her Facebook explodes with new followers. Oh, that's <laughs> um. So yes, she's Tiny Intern on on Twitter. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. I'm just putting this into the Dropbox so that Preston will have everything he requires. Excellent. Oh, good. Okay. Um, okay, cool. All right, let's go with, uh, let's see. Um, so ATPL74 notes, the best quote I've come across in conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories are the most seductive of all explanations because they require no intellectual output and they satisfy pre-existing emotional needs. And I looked for the quote on that for the source and I'm getting... I don't know where that... Kevin Myers? It's in this book. Sure. Yeah, by Kevin Myers called Watching the Door, Drinking Up, Getting Down, and Cheating Death in the 1970s. So I'm not sure if that's the original source, but I think that's a great quote. Um, and then ATPL 74 also says, what size would a telescope need to be if you wanted to be able to read a newspaper from low Earth orbit? Can you debunk a myth as, as such that spy satellites exist? Uh, so the real issue with the read in the newspaper is atmospheric turbulence. Um, I believe that we can get resolutions sufficient to uh, read license plates. Um, I'd have to do some calculations to figure out um, what size mirror you'd need? It's it's not that hard. I mean, um, there were some declassified telescopes 
provided to NASA from the yeah. military that have that kind of capability. So yeah. I wouldn't call that a conspiracy theory. There no. are, I don't, there, I don't think that there are um, Earth observing military Earth observing telescopes that can do the kind of tasking like, you know, bring in a telescope and look at that person's face. What's he reading on the newspaper? But but there are definitely um, a cluster of uh, of Earth observing satellites out there that have incredibly high resolution, much greater than what we get from like uh, GOI and things like that. And, and for those of you who are now going, why can't we find the plane? Um, for, <laughs> yeah. for those of you who are listening in the future and don't know what we're talking about, this is recorded uh, three weeks after the loss of Malaysian flight MH370. Um, and as someone who suffers through security theater on a regular basis, I've been following this. Um, and, and the issue is, it's a whole lot of water that they're searching and the high resolution satellites you can only send back so much data and so they're not turned on all the time and a lot of them have orbits that direct them um, over specific parts of the world and that part of the Pacific is not one of those parts of the world. And any who Jr. just says uh, conspiracy theory about Stonehenge, alien sightings, alien hijacking. A few days ago we could even hear a conspiracy about the Malaysia Flight 370 that they were hijacked by aliens. Oh yeah, my barn trainer is one of the people who, who we basically have a um, I said hijacking, he said aliens the day it occurred. Um, it looks like we're both wrong, but uh, I'm, I'm really hoping they find it because otherwise I'm never going to convince him. <laughs> Uh, Navdeep Sarawat commented, you guys reading the YouTube comments while casting? No, we don't read the YouTube comments while working. Yes, we do. Yes, I'm reading yeah, them right now. Does. I, I don't. Do. Um, uh, Calvin Howard says, I love this show. And Dan Bai says, I for one love the human element of this podcast. Human or alien? Okay, no making me snarf my tea online. <laughs> Surf. Um, okay. Uh, Jason Rambo says, uh, as far as I'm aware, the consensus Hi, of... Hi, Jason. Jason's uh, one of my friends. Oh, cool. As far as I'm aware, the consensus among Egyptologists currently is that no slave labor was used to build the pyramids. This yeah, it was all... Myth, stretching from ancient times. First recorded yeah, it was religious time. volunteers who were actually treated fairly well, but, for, but in general, um, that's the Egyptian pyramids. We also have the Meso... Meso... Mesopotamian region had pyramids as well, flat-topped ones, um, and then there were several pyramid-building uh, cultures in South America that eventually got eaten by Mayans and Incas. Um, and and so, in the mix of who built pyramids, were slaves and uh, war captured individuals. Uh, Nikolai Ivanov says one very crazy conspiracy I saw recently is the expanding Earth theory. Basically claims there's no plate tectonics, but that the Earth is actually expanding, and that is why the continents are moving apart. No. True? Um, one of the most ludicrous talks I've ever seen at the American Astronomical Society, a talk that convinced me there is no peer review involved in who gets to give a presentation at that conference, was a professor uh, who I believe was at Case Western, but I could be wrong on that. I just remember being shocked and confused at where he was located, who stood up holding a Nerf ball and a globe. And he said that if you cut out the continents on the globe, you can glue them onto the much smaller Nerf ball. And that in the past, the Earth was super dense. And the reality is neutron stars are the precursors to regular stars. And, and that everything started out dense. It, it was just one of these things where, and this was the last talk in a session, and it was right before an award talk. So everyone's coming in to grab seats for the award talk. And you see hands going up with the, oh, please, let me shred this person. This will be fun. Mine, mine. Yeah. Yeah. Let me yeah, no. Breaks um, conservation of many things. <laughs> Uh, Arstrosa says, uh, how do you become part of these conspiracies? I'm interested in hi helping hide evidence of aliens or faking a Mars landing. I think that's great. Um, 
uh, there, there's a number of different websites. There's one that comes up with volcanoes all the time. Um, oh, what's the big conspiracy one? Let me look for Kotla Volcano. That's how I keep trying to find it when I look up actual information. All right, hold on. So Guido Bibra says, for all things moon conspiracy, Richard Hoagland is the absolute go-to guy. I can't even, I shouldn't even have said his name. Um, <laughs> it's just about everything you can imagine on offer. Best enjoyed with a thorough debunkings of Phil Plate, of course. Yes, Phil Plate, Richard Hoagland are locked in mortal combat until the end of time. Like that Star Trek episode. Godlike Productions. Godlikeproductions.com is yeah. the place. When when you have hit that website, you know you have done something worthy yeah. of conspiracy. Yep. Um, Eric Charlin notes that there's a conspiracy on Sunday night. Way too many clouds on that particular night. No kidding. Uh, last night we had to cancel the star party. Nobody had clear skies. So it was... Except for Chris Kennedy, who uh, would have brought us Mars and Saturn, which would have been great, but that was it. So, um, Weird, uh, not quite conspiracy, but falls into the same categ category of ugh. Um, creationists led by Danny Faulkner are uh, calling for uh, Fox to provide equal time on Cosmos to creationist science and... Um, uh, uh, cos classical cosmology. Cosmos uh, episode three happened last night. Did you catch? Are you caught any Cosmos yet? No, I know you're busy. I watched it with the boy uh, this morning, and um, he said, "Dad, this is boring," and and wanted me to change the channel. He wanted to watch um, Bang Goes the Theory, which is this crazy British show. It's kind of like Mythbusters, but in in England, super yeah. great. And I'm going to kind of have to agree it was like, you know that, you haven't watched it, there's these cartoons. The whole episode was this cartoon about the relationship between Hallie and Newton and how Edmund Halley was um, Newton's only friend and helped him and helped sort of encourage him to That's battle against Hook's true. law. And I don't know. I've I i do not know the story that deeply. But but you know that, that Newton and Hook were locked in you know, they were the Hoagland and Phil Plate at the time. Um and uh, anyway, it was definitely sort of more story and less um uh more story and, and less of the kind of crazy space. Because the second episode of Cosmos was fantastic. Like one of the best I highly recommend everyone watch that second episode of Cosmos where they're talking about the, the evolution of the eye because they have this amazing thing where they show you on the one hand the animal and the kind of the, the evolution of what its eye probably started to look like and then on the other side of the frame they showed you what it saw. And so you could see like the first light sensing uh, atoms and then what it would look like to the animal and how it could sense light and then as the eye became more complicated the different kinds of things they could see until finally you had this fish eye that gave you this really great view. Yeah. It was a so, so beautiful the, explanation of of the evolution of the of the eye. And the, the, the issue that, that I'm running into is is they keep putting out things that cause the Twitterverse to convince me really life is too short for me to do that because the the first episode I saw a whole bunch of people expressing concern in various points about how they got just their facts flat out wrong in involving a particular monk, uh, Gerardino Bruno. The second episode was about the eye, and and we all have certain things that we're just really grossed out by. And I I swear, if if you if if People give me eye drops. I grow feet on my butt and start escaping <laughs> from the chair. So I just absolutely can't deal with eyeball. And it, I don't know why. It makes no sense. It makes my stomach turn inside out. Um, and then the way I heard last night's episode described was this week's Cosmos is about why you should know scientists. And I'm like, but I, I know scientists. Well, not everybody <laughs> knows scientists. I know, I know, but they haven't convinced me that, that given all the things available on Netscape and Hulu Plus, which is the only, not Netscape, on Netflix and Hulu Plus, which is how I consume video content, um, that, that, they haven't convinced me to find that time out of my day to sit here and actually watch something. Well, I'll watch it for the both of us and report. Okay. 
you know, because as you know, I am a budding um, video explainer, and yeah. uh, and I'm so not. I'm trying to understand the latest and greatest technology. In fact, we're filming, we're shooting this week. We've got a bunch of really cool topics this week. Awesome. Uh, which, of course, my mind-bending speculative ideas. Um, and... And it's an interesting to see sort of what they do and how they go about trying to explain things. So uh, it's it's research for me. But uh, yeah, but no, that, that that's all good. It's it's like I said, eyeball. No way, I was going to watch that one. Just yeah. none whatsoever. And um, with the why you should know a scientist. That was that was again. Life is short. Um, and and one of the things I tweeted at one point is like. I, I can be a total nerd when it comes to shows about like deep sea vents and exploring Antarctica. I, I tend to avoid the polar bear eating things shows. Um, but uh, I, I like my sh science shows to follow the KISS principle, keep it strictly scientific, um, because life is short. And I want to spend all that time learning, or at least as much time learning as I would on Mythbusters. And your video is totally frozen, and I don't know if you're there. I don't know if I'm there. I'm redoing my window. Hello. There are two Frasers. <laughs> so many Frasers. I don't. How far did I get? Uh, I didn't hear you at all. You froze, and I went. Your video is frozen, or is my video? I I basically babbled that I didn't know which of us was dead and rebooted the window. I was exactly the same. I didn't know whether it was me, whether it was you. What was going on? Can someone in the audience tell us, please? No. <laughs> um, I will. Uh, but we're that out is of it. time, actually. Yeah, we're pretty much out of time. Let me just see if there's anything else here that did I want to get Did you get the to. fullness of my rant? I, I did, yes. Okay. And then I was about to go into the fact that, fine, just watch it. Because it was a great explanation of the of the eyeball. It was, and I no, know it, it, no. it's, not like, it's not like they show you, know, the, you know, I you will some, read words. I will happily read, no, I'm not, I don't need no that like, in my brain. It's not like they're dissecting an eyeball. They're just care. like, they're showing these like little, all right, whatever. Um, okay. Text, I want text and line drawings only. <laughs> Um, wow, there's a ton of comments today. Um, <laughs> I um, okay, before we record more often. Okay, uh, Leonard Lindstrom says uh, the Apollo 12 broadcast did fail after Bean fried the television camera. I remember watching a live studio reenactment on television, accompanying the voices of Conrad and Bean as they did their moonwalk. I have no knowledge of this. I was not yet alive. Yeah, me too. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Bill Levine, uh, back in the 70s, aliens were dissecting cows and leaving the parts they didn't want. Why have they stopped? Because now it's being blamed on the El Chupacabra. El Chupacabra. Is that a conspiracy? It's not a conspiracy. No, world. that's an... Once it moves into woo-woo That's theory, a cryptozoology. Yeah, once it moves into just a, a nutty, crazy theory, that's not a conspiracy theory. That's something else. Um, Jason, <laughs> Jason Rambo says, what about the theory that scientists are being paid big bucks to cover up the real evidence from the loot landers, probes, etc.? Because if that's true, I'm changing careers. Scientists do not get big bucks. They sure don't. All right. I my husband's a computer scientist. They he get earns the big bucks. Normal computer science wages. I earn about a third of what my husband earns. What's what's uh, yeah? That's that's. I'm the also way. a woman, so I earn twenty percent less, and uh, I am only an assistant professor. So, yeah. <laughs> Man, there's so many great. Con I, I I I apologize to everyone who lit, let all of these post all these great comments because there's so much good stuff today. Uh, but I we've got to wrap this up. It's it's 105. We've been at it for an hour. It's time to go. Uh, our Strosa says uh, Fraser disappeared. He's getting too close to the truth. It's a conspiracy. That's man. Wouldn't that be something, huh? Oh. 
Yikes. I, uh, I was actually thinking the same thing. <laughs> that that awesome. Someone's going to make that comment. There's yeah. just too much irony in this moment. All right. Well, let's wrap this up. So once again, Pamela, thank you so much for uh, for joining me on this topic. As you can see, I, I love to talk about this kind of thing, uh, and <laughs> I know you do too. Uh, hopefully we'll have some solid science. We're still trying to sort of work out a time with Sandy uh, to talk about the LPSC. I just talked to her. Uh, so you know, probably in the next couple of days, we'll do an impromptu astronomy cast, and we'll talk about we'll talk about what happened to the LPSC. So, uh, hey, thanks, Pamela. Thanks to everyone watching. Um, the next thing to do, if person wanted to do a thing, would be obviously that episode of Astronomy Cast and Learning Space on Wednesday. Uh, actually, there's one before that. We have Google Lunar X Prize Hangout tomorrow. Uh, this is a brand new collaboration that they want to do and will be doing, are doing, pick your verb, um, a series that will allow people to get to know all of the 18 active teams that are still planning their way to the moon. And the first episode's tomorrow. We're um, having two of the teams on, part-time scientists and astrobotics. Um, and we're going to be discussing landing sites and analog simulations. And that is at noon New York and 4 p.m. London. That sounds great. All right. Well, thanks again. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you all next time. Sounds great.